Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Bandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin. Welcome to The Total Connector Show. It's all about total Bitcoin, total freedom, total decentralization. Um, I got here another special episode with um, Matthew Mysinski. Uh, host of Crypto Voice and um, and Eric Vasquil. Well, you guys know him already from my previous uh, shows. Uh, he's entrepreneur, ex Top Gun military <laughs> instructor, <laughs> um, programmer, developer, uh, uh, expert, rigid, uh, logical deducer on Austrian economics. <laughs> and we're still waiting for Max Hillebrand, uh, also like. Uh, um, pretty awesome uh, uh, Bitcoiner and uh, expert on, well, he's got, I don't know how to introduce him. He's a open source entrepreneur. He even open sourced his his thesis on GitHub. As far as I know, he calls himself the Rothbardian crypto Bitcoin anarchist, sound money agorist, pirate of Wasabi Wallet, World Crypto Network on his channel. So guys, thank you so much for your time and uh, uh, f and welcome. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Dave. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk for about 10 minutes. I don't want to drag it too long. Um, Eric, I want to start with you because there's been a very interesting discussion going on lately and also in a private chat with you. It's really exhausting sometimes to follow you, but it, it's, it's a really mental challenge. And I love those challenges. I think everybody loves it. But uh, what I'm just observing is there's this discussion or uh, attitudes, behavior, which I'm observing. Some people really interact with you what you are sort of discussing and you know sharing your thoughts your knowledge your wisdom uh on specific fundamental things when it comes to for example a, a fractional reserve banking full reserve banking excluding the state or or um uh, and that's what you're emphasizing uh, uh in your examples that you that you posted and you started discussing <coughs> could you please uh Explain to the to our viewers and listeners what is it exactly? What's the fun? What do you think? Or could it, could you just boil it down to what's the fundamental misunderstanding? Or what do you think? What people do not grasp from your, you know, point of view or comprehension and perspective when it comes to uh, you know fundamental principles of Austrian economics, creation of money, fractional reserve banking. Well, there's a, there's a lot there. Um... Uh, first, first, I'd say that uh, I use Twitter as a sounding board, like I know a lot of other people who do kind of things that, that I do uh, also do. Um, so a lot of times it's very disconnected and short and incomplete and unclear what I may be getting at, um, but I'm, <laughs> I'm doing it for my own purposes, right? Uh, I want to see how, what people understand, how they react, what their, what their um, arguments are. And uh, there's a lot of smart people, a lot of good Austrians. I mean, Bitcoin is, seems to be exclusively Austrian, um, which is great. Uh, I am as well. Um, but uh, so that's, that's kind of what's going on right now. Um, I've got, uh, I tend to do it a lot more when I'm writing. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've written 72 topics so far in my uh, series. Um, and uh, I've, got a, I've got a handful more that, uh, are just uh, maturing and this is kind of what tends to happen so um, about disagreement or misunderstanding uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background I, um, um, I, I consider myself a Rothbardian I, I, I mean n n not necessarily exclusively in theory but he, he just writes very clearly and I use him as a reference and <coughs> a few years ago I, I uh, finally uh, went through man economy and the state, his magnum opus, um, uh, very, very closely. Uh, and um, I found very, very little that I could dispute or disagree with, um, with one exception. Um, and I'll explain why I was uncomfortable with it. And it was his treatment of fractional banking, some of it, not all of it. Um, and um, to his credit, I think Rothbard equivocates on this subject and this subject only. There's no, there's no thing 
else in the book um, or that I found anywhere else in his writing where he doesn't seem sure of himself and leaves open the possibility that it might be something else. Um, so I'm not sure if he was writing um, out of deference to the school, to Mises. Uh, originally, he started out just basically trying to, uh, you know, represent Mises's work and ended up creating um, some new work of his own. But um, the reason his treatment of fractional banking made me uncomfortable, um, but not yet with full clarity, uh, was the fact that it, it violated fundamental principles. Um, his own principles, right? So our Austrian principles. And the first of which is essentially the non-aggression principle, right? Um, if it's the, 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 def the, the defining criteria between if you're gonna say right and wrong is aggression. So if you take free banking, there's no aggression, right? So labeling it wrong, um, you know, is, is, raises questions. And um, usually the answer to that question, which Rothbard does uh, propose, is that um, it's inherent fraud. In other words, uh, when people engage uh, in, the, in the contract of fractional banking, um, they're being defrauded by the other party in the contract. That implies that people are too stupid to understand the contract. And I've read other works by other Austrians who explicitly say this. People aren't smart enough, therefore too stupid to understand the contract. M my response to that is, you understand it or you wouldn't be able to tell me that, right? So clearly false. People can understand it. Um, and I think quite clearly the re reason people don't even bother with reading the contract is by the, the vast majority of deposits in banks are insured by the state, the taxpayer. So it doesn't matter what the contract says. Um, their, lo their, their deposits are not subject to loss in places where they're insured, so the contract's irrelevant. It's been superseded by the state. Um, so in mentioning the state, I, uh, you have to remove the state from any discussion of fractional banking to understand its nature, which is exactly what Rothbard does in the entire man economy in the state. He reserves discussion of state intervention to a whole nother at the time, book, Power and Market, which he intended to publish as part of one book, but couldn't get the publisher to publish it um, because it was too anarchistic, and this was during the 50s. Um, so it eventually got composed, composed, recomposed into one book, which is a little redundant because of it. But anyway, you can't analyze the effects of fractional banking without removing the state and aggression. So I was uncomfortable with it. Um, and I've spent a good amount of time over the years uh, thinking about it. And finally, I, I feel like I have clarity on all the relevant issues. So I started to discuss those with people and write about it. What is the central um, argumentation point from, from other so-called Austrian economics or, uh, you know, more uh, experienced Austrian economics, you know, all these podcasters on uh, I mean there's you know there's there seems to be um, I don't know some kind of disagreement or misconception what what is it uh, what's what's the central point here I mean what do you observe um, what do you hear well so there's a lot of issues I mean there's a lot of Bitcoiners and Austrians um, probably because a lot of Bitcoins Bitcoiners uh, read Austrian economics uh, I think very few of them can read it to full and complete understanding, at least that's been my experience in discussing with them, but some do. And um, they tend to take what famous Austrians say about fractional banking um, uh, without question, right? So there's, there's very little deep inquiry into this conflict that I'm discussing, right? That I'm just, to me, this is, a, this is an inherent conflict. Um, so how can the free market be bad, right? Um, and I think the issue fundamentally comes down to a lack of understanding of what's really happening. Um, and surprisingly, I see that lack of understanding in quite a bit of Austrian economic, you know, accepted as proven, um, literature. Um, but I don't accept it. 
um, the the lack of understanding, I think. Are, so what happens is people initially think they understand how banking's work, banking works, right? People deposit savings, bankers lend out those savings to earn to earn uh, you know um, economic interest, and then they then they um, pay the depositors some fraction of that economic interest uh, in exchange for their um, deposits. So that's what's considered the naive view, right? <clears throat> then you learn a little bit more, which takes quite a while, and, and you have to be pretty far along to learn how um, banks actually mechanically operate, what their accounting practices are. And then you realize what a bank typically does when it issues a loan is it creates two accounts. It creates an, an account called a, a money account for the, for the borrower uh, upon which the borrower can draw or on which the borrower can draw out the money that he's borrowed. And it creates an, they create another account, which this is the, the debt account, um, which is their asset. They hold the note that represents uh, the loan. So in this, in this example I've given you, there's no money, right? There's two accounts been created. The debt account is an asset. It, it, it can be traded, it's a note, right? So those, those notes can become money instruments. The money account is also an asset of the, of the borrower. And of course, that money can be traded, right? So what's happened is there's, there's, there's more apparent money in the system. This is called credit expansion. So people look, I, I watched somebody link to me a video, a YouTube video on, on somebody, you know, I forget his name, who had done an empirical analysis of this and confirmed that's exactly what banks do. Well, well, well no kidding, that's just, that's accounting, right? Um, so. So this, this, when you get to this point of the learning is where things tend to stop. Um, so it, even in that video, that's where it stopped. Okay, shock, um, you know, amazement, fraud. How oh my God, these banks are just creating, creating money or money instruments out of thin air, right? So that's where I think the problem comes is people don't think beyond that. So the questions I raise are, um, what happens when the borrower draws on the account? Where does the money come from? <laughs> it's a pretty simple question. So I, I could create that same, that same double set of accounts, um, issue you a loan, hold, hold the asset for the debt myself without any money whatsoever, zero reserve. Have I created money? No, right? So. You know, it just it just touches on the issue. I can go into a lot more depth on on the equivalence of that versus the naive system, but that's ultimately my point. They're exactly equivalent. All that has to happen is the person who took out the loan, instead of having a money account, just withdraw all the cash, right? That cash had to come from somewhere. Now the bank has a a, a, a debt instrument, right? The uh, the loan note, um, and the borrower has the cash. No new money created. There's an obligation which represents credit expansion. That obligation, which should be obvious, is inherent in every loan, right? Every loan consists of the money lent being in one person's hands and a note being in the other person's hands. It doesn't matter whether banks do it or individuals do it. Credit expansion is necessary, inherent uh, in lending. And that doesn't so another point we, we tend to always get wrapped around on is the equivalence, the uh, isomorphism between lending as equity and lending as debt. They're in Austrian economics identical. So it doesn't matter whether I issue a loan or I buy a fraction of a company. In both cases, I'm buying a fraction of a company in exchange for future yield. I'm buying some portion of future earnings. Um, and I'm owning a fraction of that company, even if I'm just a, a creditor. So the, Rothbard is very clear about this, and so are many Austrians, but many people I discuss with aren't, so we have long discussions about that. And what you come down to is all investment, all lending, creates credit, right, which expands money instruments, or what people call them, you know, the, the M1 or money supply, right? So when does this expansion occur? Is one day there none of it? And then the next day, oh my God, you know, all these loans get created and now there's inflation? No, there's the lending and money developed together. So 
the rate of expansion is typically zero, right? There's no new expansion. It's already fully expanded all the time. So what creates additional expansion is people reducing their reserve requirements, right? Individuals saying, I will lend more of my money um, or banks doing it or more actual currency, which is not a function of banks, right? So, so if that person who took all that money out of the bank or from the, the lender decides to put it back in the bank, what happens? Now the bank has the money, right? And it has both notes, both, both accounts, right? <laughs> so it's identical. The, the two scenarios are identical. If you just issue the loan as cash and you hand it to the person, or if you create these two accounts, which appear to be money creation out of thin air, um, they're identical. All the, all the borrower is going to do is put the, you know, put the money in some, put some fraction of the money in a hoard and put the rest in an investment, which could just be a bank. It results in the exact same thing. So I don't see how um, smart Austrians can miss this, but everybody does. Okay. We've got to differentiate now. We, we're talking about uh, hi, Max Hillebrand. Welcome. I already introduced you in the very hey, beginning. Can you hear me? Uh, can you say something? Yes. Hey, hey. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the show. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. Eric's talk just was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I've been waiting to, to you know, talk to you for a while because I saw you at the Value Bitcoin conference in Munich uh, a while ago. So before I lose my thread here of, of thoughts, uh, listen, Eric, I mean, uh, first of all, I want to have the opinion also or the feedback of Matthew and Max because I know Max has been a little bit following you uh, lately, in the, especially yesterday or was it the day before yesterday on this uh, Twitter thread. Um, look, um, this is a very, very, very crucial point here to understand because we've got to differentiate the groups who whom are we talking or who are we sharing this knowledge with it's not only you know we're not talking this this podcast or video is not only about for you know the the, the knowledgeable austrian economists who've read you know a bunch of books but um but also you know for the let's just call it the layman so because the classical line of thinking is that okay this is what we you know we've been uh, been reading in Austrian Austrian economics uh, is that through fractional reserve banking. I, mean, I also read De Soto's book Money, Bank Credit, and Economic Cycles. That through fractional reserve banking, uh, with the deposits, uh, uh, you know, the banks create money out of thin air. So there is a money expansion. There's always this talk about money expansion. Credit and I want credit. Okay, so it's called credit expansion. Well, there is monetary expansion and there is credit expansion. Monetary expansion is in our system. It creates new currency or in gold what mining does or in Bitcoin, you know, what, what Bitcoin does. There's new units of currency, um, present currency being created. Credit expansion is a consequence of lending, investing. Okay. So... Uh... Uh, Max, uh, Matthew, can you can you give can you give me your thoughts and then all together can we like make the because it's about Bitcoin, you know, Austria? Can we bridge that? What what would be like? What is the realistic scenario under you know the under a monetary root layer of Bitcoin? What what would credit expansion look like or lending on the basis of monetary root laying of Bitcoin? Is is that does that make sense? My question. Well, I, I, I agree that it's important to differentiate between the credit ex or credit in general and money in general and the expansion of the total supply here. Because, uh, for example, if Alice has a gold coin and she lends it to Bob, she did not magically increase the money supply of gold. Right? That was that is static. That did not change. But what did change, as Eric pointed out, is before there, like be before this act, there was no credit at all. Right? Alice had her money and Bob had his. But as soon as Alice gives this money or lends this money to Bob, then we do have an increase in, in credit uh, or credit supply, which in, in general is, is nothing bad, right? That's just an inherent thing of, of how credits fundamentally have to work. Um, though I, I then would maybe differ or let's say be a bit more nuanced here in the sense that we have the issue of, of time preference here, right? That is the, the money reserved and the, the money held by individuals um, and the savings of them. 
uh, we save in order to remove uneasiness uh, in the uncertain future. Uh, and the uncertain future is, is very important here. And then the question is, how long can we plan ahead in order to well uh, prepare for these future uncertainties? And with, let's say, a expansive money supply, right, if we have... Uh, Inflation, meaning more money supply as would have been uh, issued in a voluntary free market, right? Bitcoin does not have inflation. It has an issuance rate. Um, and if, if we have artificial inflation here, then this means that in general, it decreases our time, pre sorry, it increases our time preference, meaning that individuals are more likely uh, to borrow, right? Their, their need for borrowing uh, increases. But we, we I, I, would okay, Wait, sorry, I would disagree with, with just one, one comment, Max. Mm -hmm. um, Time preference is a given in, in praxeology, right? It's, it can't be said what will or will not increase it or decrease it. What, what I think, I hope you mean to say, is that a change in interest rates will cause more or less uh, investment because of people's time preference, right? In other words, at a high, you're, without your time preference changing, if interest rates rise, you may now invest um, because now your time preference is being satisfied. Um, it, I'd be very careful, and I see a lot of uh, people being casual with this, but, but, but trying to say explicitly what will or will not change pers a person's time preference, but it's a preference. It's human. It's in the mind, right? And it's a uh, given, and, which means it can't be deduced. Yes, and individual and subjective, right? Right. It's, it's very much like all valuation, right? It's the valuation of time or time with your stuff. All valuation is subjective, so time preference is a subjective value. And one cannot say what determines those preferences. They are the givens in economics. So, uh, yes, if interest rates change, what does that mean? That means people's time preference has changed. So the formula is re reversed from what you said. If people's time changes, interest rates Right. And if interest rates change, people with the same time preference, if the interest rates increase, will invest more. There'll be more money, actually, or capital actually saved for longer, uh, invested for longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. So there, I, I see quite a bit of, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but I, but I see Austrians claiming that, you know, this and that changes people's time preference and therefore it's good or bad. Um, those are just... Uh, for an Austrian, at least, in uh, falsehoods. These things can't be said. Um, what you can say is, you know, marginal value changes with every new unit of, uh, of something you have, right? So your preference may change because you have more or less of the same thing. Um, that's, that can be said, but, but uh, it can't be said, for example, that interest rates change time preference. We don't know. Can't know. Um, Max, can I clarify something? Because you said previously, uh, would it be correct to say that we still don't have like a disinflationary Bitcoin? It, it, it'll, it'll take some years because you just said previously, Bitcoin doesn't have inflation, but not yet. Would you say it's a, we still have a, a sort of a m even minimal rate of inflation in Bitcoins? maybe in four years or whatever, or after the next halving or something like that, right? Well, well, you see, as a full node, you download the Bitcoin Core software or whatever other implementation like Eric's Le Bitcoin, And then with you installing or compiling this piece of software, you, you specify the rules and you therefore agree to the rules, right? So this is a voluntary action. And because it's a voluntary action, uh, this can, per definition, not entail any inflation because inflation is an increase of the money supply in access of what free individuals would have chosen without uh, this aggression right um so so in in that sense then there is an issuance rate there is an increase in the money supply but that increase is is known and it's agreed by every single individual running a full node and therefore well and every individual holding Bitcoin. I guess, no, I guess it's running a full node is, is, is more here. Well, it's when you, when you buy the Bitcoin and when you trade for it, you, you the market is fully aware yeah. of the inflation schedule, which means um, it's necessarily capitalized into every purchase. Mm -hmm. But um, it's an interesting si side note, and I, I don't want to sidetrack your thought, Max, um, but I would refer people to Rothbard's treatment of um, the effects of taxation on property, right? When, it's pro when property tax is known, 
uh, at the time it's imposed, the owner of the owners of all the property, say real estate, <coughs> immediately suffer the consequences of that tax. Nobody else does. No future owner does. It's an immediate loss in the value of the property that gets capitalized into the into the resale value of the property, right? And every every other every other owner of that property has paid less for the property, right? Which means the first, the owner when the tax was imposed was the one who got taxed. Uh, Man economy in the state has a, good, a really good uh, section on that. So I. I relate that to the treatment of inflation in Bitcoin. I actually wrote this topic, inflation fallacy, and Max, you're describing it pretty closely. The, the idea that the first purchaser um, or the person who holds it when the unknown inflation becomes known is the person who pays the tax. But in Bitcoin, it's always been known, right? So nobody has ever paid an inflation tax in Bitcoin. That, that cost of those increased units has been capitalized in by the miners who first acquired them in exchange for energy cost. Uh, yes, but um, I, I just would like to add one more thing that we did have inflation in Bitcoin um, at one point, and that was the value overflow incident in August 15, 2010, <laughs> yeah. right? Because exactly. here, how much was like 180 billion Bitcoin uh, were created in this one transaction. And this is a increase of the money supply in access to what free individuals would choose. That is inflation. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the cool thing is we, we, we could defend against that inflation uh, by, well, kind of, I guess it was blacklisting that transaction or, or just rolling back the chain and, and fixing it. Um, so, so we did have inflation, but we fixed it. We had, we had unpredictable inflation. We have monetary inflation. It's just predictable, therefore capitalized. Well, but, but it, because it's predictable and because it's, uh, it, it's voluntarily chosen, I wouldn't call it inflation. Well, it's, inflation is just literally an increase in money supply. So either you treat it as there's 21 million, there's always 21 million and never changed, right? But they're not on the market. So when you talk about supply, supply refers to what's uh, on the market. So you can say there's an increase, an increase of marketable Bitcoin over time, which is the definition of increased money, money, increased money supply is monetary inflation. So it's better, I think, to refer to it as predicted or 100% pre predictable inflation, which therefore is capitalized and has no inflationary effect on value. Um, be because it can't, right? It, ha it, it has to be capitalized in just like the, the cost of your known property tax is capitalized by the buyer of the property. They factor that into the price of the property. Okay, so that's important. So 100% predictable inflation is calculated into the price, like, right? Yes, before before okay. any Bitcoin no? is ever is ever owned, right? Because the miner has to has to yeah. understand every you know, the, the the market of miners who are mining Bitcoin are paying for it. And they know that it depreciates at a fixed rate, it's just like buying a piece of property that you know is taxed at a certain rate. Mm -hmm. Matthew, Max, you have any other thoughts? Want to round this up? I agree. Bitcoin <laughs> is uh, non-inflationary. We haven't been. Uh, we've been saying that actually almost our entire show. Uh, our first guest, who in my opinion is one of the best uh, monetary economists in the world, his name is George Selgin. He's also a free banker. Uh, he brought this up on our show. Many economists have brought up on our show. Um, not everybody has called it that, but you know, I used to call it inflation. But the fact that it's predictable, the fact that you know, yeah, uh, I, just, I now call it something more I just like call it predictable, uh, predictable monetary inflation, right? I mean, yeah, or or you can just call it issuance. You can call it issuance or something like that. But the uh, the fact that it's predictable, yeah, you know, it's twenty one million. That is a very unique. <laughs> monetary asset that's very different than anything uh, in the history of the monetary world. And even, I mean, obviously fiat's not predictable, obviously, but even gold and silver, you know, I mean, we could mine asteroids. Uh, we could, we can always, it's true that the amount of gold in the ground, in the crust of the earth is fixed, but that's not true economically. Reserves have always grown. Uh, inflation of gold and silver has always grown. It's actually slightly increasing in recent years. Really? Uh, in gold, like more than 2%? Yeah. yeah, in gold and silver. It's a little bit over the average. The all-time average is about Wow, 1. okay, the, I didn't know that. The, the, key, the, key is, the essential difference there between commodity money inflation and state money inflation 
is that commodity money inflation is in a sense predictable, right? It follows demand. Mm -hmm. As demand increases, price rises, creating more incentive to compete, produce more units, um, which brings the price back down. So um, it is stable in that, the term I use for that is stable and not in any way related to volatility and non-volatility, stability and instability, right? Something that has a, has a negative pressure when pricing, a negative price pressure when price increases. Um, so predictable in that sense, that when price increases, more will be found, <laughs> right? And um, all commodities exhibit that characteristic, except Bitcoin, no more will be found. However, yeah, the, the beauty of the difficulty. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I'd, I'd maybe like to point out here this definition of Jörg Guido Hultzmann in the ethics of money production, uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, just to quote here, we can define inflation as an extension of the nominal quantity of any medium of exchange beyond the quantity that would have been produced on the free market. Mm -hmm. I, um, so, so I, again, Eric, I, 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 I agree that's with the, not, the money supply. Yeah, increases. that's a... That's a perfectly but, rational uh, definition. It's just not the common definition. Right? Um, the common well, definition he, is any increase in the units of the, of the money. <laughs> he says here one sentence later, this definition corresponds by and large to the way inflation has been understood until World War uh, II. Uh, so yes, in the current Keynesian mindset, of course, this, this, is, this is not uh, what you're talking about. Now inflation is like yeah. a decrease of purchasing power or something. But uh, I, I think this here uh, oh. encapsulates really uh, the, this entire subject nicely because inflation is much more than just the decrease of purchasing power. Right? It also leads well, to capital misallocation, malinvestment, overconsumption. You, uh, you seem to be mixing the two concepts of monetary inflation and price inflation. These are, I never, I, I rarely, <laughs> not intentionally use the term inflation without that qualifier because these are two very distinct concepts and that definition is somewhere in between, right? because mon monetary inflation is just increase in the money supply and price inflation is increase in prices, right? So um, in prices are, are subjective, right? Uh, the number of units of a money is not. Um, so this idea that uh, above a certain level that would have been produced on the free market is kind of a get, trying to get closer to price inflation. Presumably, that level that would be produced on the free market would not produce price inflation. But that's not necessarily the case, right? For example, the Comstock load discovery in uh, Virginia City led to massive monetary inflation and did lead to price inflation in silver for a long time, if not forever. Um, so it's not necessarily, in my mind, a very uh, useful um, middle ground. But anyway, I think we're getting we're getting sidetracked on the technical. Yeah, the and he does. Inflation. Yeah, we we all I think generally agree and understand the the important one, which is the classical traditional monetary inflation. But Hulsman does uh, later, perhaps in that chapter, Max, he does make a distinction. He says, as long as you're consistent uh, between the definitions of monetary inflation and price infl inflation, then you know that's just how it's used today in economics. But he does make that distinction uh, later in, in probably yeah. that. Chapter. And I tend to say Bitcoin's not inflationary, and that's the one, it's just a, it's kind of an ambiguous statement, right? Because it is monetarily inflationary for a time. Um, it says nothing about price inflation, but what I'm referring to is um, the fact that all inflation is known. So it's not inflationary, right? It's, it's not a very good way to say it. I call the, the, the topic inflation fallacy because people believe it's inflationary. And I believe the inflation has to be capitalized, so it's not. You, you know, actually, something a, a bit on a completely other side note, but uh, somewhat in the same context. Can we say that the, the mining and the issuance rate of Bitcoin through the Coinbase reward is homesteading of, of defined Bitcoin that are not yet found, right? But on the other hand, could we say that every UTXO is a abundant or, well, a... a Na a unused natural resource and the first one to provide the valid witness script is the individual who is homesteading that individual UTXO. I think it's a fair analogy or description. I mean, whether you call it homesteading or just mining to me is probably not economically important, but it is 
consistent, I think, with the concept of homesteading. It's out there free for the taking if somebody wants to grab it, right? I'm going to be honest. Can you break this down or formulate it differently, Max? <laughs> Sorry, but so what well, did you say with the UATX? Well, so I mean, there were there were two kind of different concepts here on how we could define homesteading of Bitcoin. Either we say that there is a total natural supply of 21 million Bitcoin and they are in existence already because they are defined in the protocol, mm -hmm. but they can only be, well, let's say used when, uh, or, well, they, they can be used for the first time, so to say, when the miner finds valid proof of work mm -hmm. over a valid block. And then with the act of, of looking for and eventually finding uh, th this proof of work, then we, He's the first one to really use that Bitcoin in, let's say, block 600,000, right? The Bitcoin in block 600,000 has already, like, it was already there. It's defined in Nakamoto consensus. But because we have not yet reached block 600,000, for now, it is homestead or it, it is an a, um, unoccupied good. And the miner who does find valid proof of work for block 600,000, he can be the one to, well, use it for the first time and thus homestead it. Yeah, and he pays a price for that homesteading, which is what homesteaders do. Um, I, I think it's a very apt analogy because uh, if you think of if you think of it, I, I've actually described um, issuance versus um, uh, authorization uh, in this context. Uh, when you when you think about stock in a company, companies formed a certain amount of stock is authorized by the shareholders, but it's not actually accounted for as a share until it's issued to somebody right bought or otherwise so um essentially traded so you you can think of what you're describing as the bitcoin is in the ground right but somebody's got to go spend the time and money to probabilistically find it and at that point predictable only due to probability just like gold um it will become spendable which means part of the money supply until then it's not just like authorized but not issued stock is not authorized but not issued stock may be fully predictable or maybe not predictable when, when it's going to be issued um in this case probabilistically we have predictability in in the uh, issuance of bitcoin mm -hmm. yeah and but, but i think we can also spin this in a somewhat different way and matthew i'd, I'd like to take or hear your take because this is something that we talked about on, on the crypto voices show um the it's tied with scarcity, right? And scarcity being exclusive ownership and, and limited quantity. Um, and the thing is that private keys are just number, right? They're larger random numbers, zeros and ones, and they are non-scarce. Therefore, there, there is no property right uh, to allocate these numbers, right? Non-scarce numbers. So in a sense, you don't own your private key, but the private key gives you the opportunity, according to Nakamoto consensus, to advance the chain of digital signatures and to move that UTXO onto a new script. Now then the question is, because you cannot own private keys, can we then actually say that you own a UTXO? Or is it maybe again somewhat similar that UTXOs are um, uh, unoccupied goods and the first one who can well, who can provide a valid witness script uh, is the one who homesteads that UTXO. So kind of we, we create the UTXO as the output of a transaction, and then it's this natural resource in nature. But as soon as we then spend that coin in the input of the next transaction, that is the point where this um, not abundant but uh, unoccupied UTXO actually gets used. But I'm, I'm not so certain about this one. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I don't, I think just stretching the analogy a little bit too far, but I'm let Matt, you know, chime in, I guess you asked him. Well, I haven't uh, fully decided. I mean, you're, you're alluding to what Stefan Kinsella said, and he said that on our show as well, Max, you know, that you can't technically own a Bitcoin. And um, the, uh, to me, the analogy, uh, I'm not sure if there's a distinction or a difference if you just compare it to something like a bearer asset, you know, like, um, you know, a couple ounces of gold in your house or something. I mean, you can have those stolen from you, just like you can have a private key stolen and then you don't have it anymore. Uh, it's the same type of a thing. The way that the ownership becomes 
involved in the legal system today is if you would bring in institutions to help protect it. You know, so if you brought that that gold asset to a warehouse and then had that posted as a bailment, or if you brought it to a lender and people wanted that gold and you can loan it out, then you start to establish legal precedent of the asset and a legal uh, paper trail, so to say, of the asset. But I'm not sure the difference. I mean, I, I understand the analogy, but I'm not sure economically it makes any difference whether we say that we can own a Bitcoin or not, because just like a bare asset, like you can have cash stolen from you, you may be able to get it back, you can get law enforcement involved, you can get the law involved. But economically, a bare asset is just that. I mean, it's a bare asset. And typically that, by the way, is what base money is. It's a bare asset that's under just your homesteaded control. And uh, at the very, very basic layer of it, if you can co-opt it i think that was the the word that you used uh max um on our show then you have you, you know you hold it if you own it or not i'm not sure if there's a distinction there that i'm necessarily interested in well, making. But, but i think i have a, a useful analogy um say you have a you have an ounce of gold and you put it in your safe it's a combination safe the number to to the safe is what you're using to secure it your, your exclusive knowledge of that number. Is the number property? Does it matter? Does that mean you can't own gold? Yeah, but is there differentiation? There's a differentiation between ownership, of course, yeah, and control, as, you, as Matt said, and possession. Because I studied law, and you know, we always made this distinction between immediate, non-immediate. Uh, do you speak German, Max? Because, uh, you know, mittelbare besitz, unmittelbare besitz, like, I don't know how to call it, direct, indirect, possession. Mm -hmm. over an access maybe it's just i don't know maybe it's just a stupid you know intellectual well, massage here but <laughs> my, my point is just that you know if, if if by that argument you can't own bitcoin then you can't own gold mm. right if gold's secured by a secret combination right it, so it it, it it i i kind of agree with matt it's not it doesn't really matter but you can see that the analogy uh, would have to be stretched to you not owning gold either um so it's a it may not that the number itself is not property but bitcoin is just numbers and we're claiming that bitcoin is property so at some point right so it doesn't matter whether the number itself is property or not no. and I, th I think i can jump in here because um it was useless I, I didn't... now it's useful and you secure it yeah and, and I, I didn't really uh we get a chance to speak earlier when when Eric was uh, going off on on fractional reserve banking or whatnot. But you know, there obviously these things get conflated in arguments, and there's so many little nested faux pas and nested taboos in this in this debate, really amongst Austrians that really has no real world consequence. So it's why it's why I not right. really like, I love uh, talking about it over beer or whatever, but like I I don't I don't take it seriously as like a real debate. In, in the context of the market. Now, the first thing that I, I would go back to that Eric said at the beginning, which I absolutely agree with and I 100% am on board with, is that you know we are, again, conflating what the state does in the market, which is basically a monopoly. It's Adam Smith's definition of once you have the state involved in the market, that's monopoly, versus just the market, versus the free market, and how the market uh, law would act, how enforcing different clauses and contracts would go. Uh, you know, we just aren't at a phase in society where we have a pure free market. You know, whether we get there, there's a lot of uh, ifs, ands, or buts about it. But the, the first distinction in my mind, which everybody should agree with on this argument, is that the whole argument about controlling assets, was it a bailment, is it debtor credit or relationship, whatnot, is that we're talking about a system today and really a system for the last few hundred years that the state has massively monopolized. And again, this is where the problem with Bitcoin is. This is where you get to Eric's other arguments about you know, Bitcoin versus the state. But I think that that's, that's really an important point for me is that it, it doesn't, you can't get anywhere, you can't even get out the front door of this argument if, if you say, okay, we just need to have 100% reserves of an asset and we don't have it and we would have it if we didn't have a state 
uh, monopoly of Bitcoin or a monopoly of uh, money. Those things, you know, you, you have to parse through many, many things before you can get to any sort of a logical understanding of it. And then once you do, once you, Eric was talked about it as well, you look at the accounting of money and banks over the years, look at the fungibility of money. You look at the way that cash has worked physically. You, you understand that it's actually a complete farce that the goldsmiths exit scammed ever like in, in medieval times or in British times in the 17 and 1800s in the industrial revolution, there was never any evidence of a, of a goldsmith. The, the classical, uh, you know, the classical thing here that economists like to mumble about is that goldsmiths basically exit scammed with the gold and left us with the paper. It's actually not true at all. I mean, the paper was demanded. That was what became deposits, checks, promissory notes, bills of exchange. It was so much easier so much more affordable and uh, and more effective in banking that that's simply the way that that system came about. It's a completely different system than Bitcoin, different security model. It's physical. It's not digital. There's so many things you have to you have to talk about before you even get to Bitcoin. But the the fractional reserve argument uh, basically boils down to first of all understand that the state is. Uh, involved, so we don't have a free market in in banking, and the state has always gotten involved. So the state has proven that they can monopolize these bear assets. They've monopolized the base money of gold, and then once you once you get to that, you can't really can't really go any farther as far as the validity of fraction reserve banking or not, because we just don't have a, a free market in banking. We have had historical examples, which are very interesting to look at. And we've had Sweden, Scotland, Canada in the 1700s, 1800s. Um, those, there have been pockets of societies that have gone on unencumbered by the monopoly of the state. And they've done just fine. They've had no issue with any reserve uh, problems or exit scams by goldsmiths or runs on the bank. Uh, usually those are problems of overbearing states. And, you know, and then you get into a whole other issues about studying those things about banks. But basically, money is once it gets into a bank, once there's some sort of banking, accounting, economic, uh, legal thing that comes into the picture, it's simply a debtor creditor relationship. You don't have the money anymore. Once you put it into a, a bank, it's not a bailment. It's not a property title. It's not a, any of that. And, and my co-host, Fernando, actually studied under Jesus Suerta de Soto, who is the, the most vocal in this point, uh, who we've already referenced already in the show. Um, you know, I, I, I have that tome as well of his, I haven't read it cover to cover, but, uh, I, I am much less persuaded on that. And I'm happy to send links as well. Like there's a lot of the free bankers that have responded to that. Like since ancient times, everybody has come up with the opposite, uh, conclusion than DeSoto has regarding bailments and money, uh, how it works in the banking system. Basically, through, from ancient times, where there's like loose coins versus uh, coins in a sealed bag. If it was in a sealed bag, then it was, you know, an irregular deposit. Then it was like a bailment. The bank had to keep it on, outside of its books. It couldn't lend it out. But if it was loose coins, the Roman term was a mutuum. A mutuum. It would basically just, uh, as long as the depositor got something back of equivalent value, that was actually what legal courts decided both in Roman law and when you get to common law, when you get to British law, same thing. There's a couple landmark cases. I can't remember by name in the 1700s, 1800s, the exact same things basically decided. Uh, these are simply, uh, it's a debtor creditor relationship. It's very simple. Once you deposit the money, you don't have the money. The bank has the money, it can lend it out, can do what it's want, it, it wants with it. It's its asset. It can invest it. But then after some time, you have something else which is called a claim on the money and if you want to uh request it back from the bank that is your right whether the bank can honor it or not uh is an issue of the market it's an issue of the market it's an issue of the interest rate all the other things that eric was mentioning there as well uh you have to let the market sort those things out and the final point i'll say is i said it on our last show as well but one of the more vocal full reservists is Bob Murphy. We had him on our show. I like him a lot. He's a Rothbardian. He's an anarcho-capitalist. Absolutely like him uh, on pretty much every other issue. But he even said on our show, notably, notably, without me prompting, he said, you know, okay, 
because I asked him, like, well, what do you want to do about it? Do you want the SEC to enforce it? How do you want to get to full reserve banking, 100% reserve banking? And he said, well, no, I don't want the SEC to get involved or more federal regulation or anything. He's like, I just think that in a free banking economy, the, the reserve ratio would be higher than what Dr. Selgin thinks. Dr. Selgin thinks it'd be much lower and many other free bankers think it'd be much lower. I think it'd be much higher. And then he said, I don't think it would be literally 100%, but it'll be higher. And so that, there again, you get to these issues of like, if he doesn't think it'll be literally 100%, what are we arguing about? And again, this goes back to reserve ratios. There's no way the Federal Reserve knows what the reserve ratio is. They can't blanket just, man, that's a price control. They can't blanket say that the reserve ratio in Montana or in Germany or wherever should be this, this, and this, depending on you know whatever the central governing planning board authority. That was what Hayek talked about, the pretense of knowledge. There's no way that a planning board can do that you have to let the market sort it out. And that's why I'm generally a believer in the, the so-called modern free banking school. But again, if you want to bring it to Bitcoin now, which is a more interesting discussion, uh, whether or not uh, uh, free banking can work in Bitcoin, that gets more interesting because then you talk about more about Eric's security model, which is, you know, the state versus Bitcoin, because we already know what happened with gold and silver past based money and current based money. It's it's completely monopolized by the state. <laughs> the more interesting question now and in the future and for Bitcoin is can Bitcoin elude, you know, in a roundabout way as uh, as Hayek said as well, can it elude the controls of the state? Uh, I just I make a couple comments on uh, on your references. Uh, DeSoto uh, is one of the gentlemen I was referring to who claims uh, fractional banking is a fraud because people are too stupid, right? Apparently he's not, but everybody else is. Uh, I, I don't, I don't accept that. People, if people contract voluntarily and knowingly, um, fractional banking exists uh, and it's not a fraud. And that is certainly possible. So assuming that possibility, the other, the other thing um, I, I would, I would point out is that yes, the state is always a factor, but, um, economics is the study of how things work absent the state, and then that informs what the effect of the state or aggression is. And that's exactly how Rothbard laid it out. In what are the forces at work in a free market? And then what are the effects on that market um, necessarily? These are not empirical, these are not observed, these are deduced. Um, so, about banking and fractional reserve, I'm trying to get people to understand the necessary of lending um, and the necessity of lending and what it produces before involving the effects of the state on that process. And I think it's absolutely essential that those be separated, aggression, uh, you know, consequences in a, in a um, and the consequences then of adding aggression uh, to that system. Um, so in my, dis my discussions recently, I've, I've, been, um, I've been focusing on uh, what is the, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little distracted because I'm driving through the airport right now. Um, I I'm focusing on what is the behavior of what we call bank. Of banking as special, uh, as uniquely bad uh, in a free market, is that you don't need to call what is being done banking. Anybody can do it in a free market. And everybody does do it, even in the not free market. Um, people take a certain amount of their assets, whether they borrow them from somebody else or they borrow them from themselves, and they invest slash lend a certain fraction of those. Remember the equivalency of those two uh, terms. Sorry, I'm getting my I'm getting my parking ticket. Um, and they they take some fraction of their their capital. They save it. Uh, they save their capital right from their savings. They take some fraction. They hoard it, and they take the rest. Necessarily, the rest of their savings has to be invested. Um, otherwise, it's part of their hoard. So, this is fractionalism. That's, that's what it is. It has nothing to do with banking. That's, a, that's, a, that's the fundamental principle that people get wrong. This has nothing to do with banking. 
when people lend to other they are engaging in fractional lending. The, uh, the people who receive those, the proceeds of that loan then take a fraction of it, hoard it for their liquidity requirements, say it's a company, and they invest the rest of those savings. Otherwise it's all hoarded, right? As that process yeah. continues, that process continues, eventually all capital is hoarded by someone and you have credit expansion as a purely as a function of the reserve ratio of each individual person in the aggregate. That's it, no banking involved, fractional reserve, credit expansion, fractionalism, risk are all inherent in lending. And without lending, there's no production, none. And without production, there's no products. And without products, there's no capital. So then none of this exists, right? So these are necessary except in a purely subsistence economy where there's no capital. And by the way, Bitcoin slices through all of the haziness and confusion around banking because you can very clearly see with a fixed supply that you can clearly have more than one credit on one Bitcoin. Imagine just us four, there's one Bitcoin between four of us. There's no limit. Credit comes from within us. Like it's a promise in entrepreneurship and business. Well, we may deliver on there it. There is a limit. Not. But, no, but there, there is, there's no a, limit on any promises that anybody can make in the. Well, I mean, there's, there is a limit to credit expansion, and this is something that, um, you know, my my is in this, and I think he airs yeah, closely. Yeah. He he claims you know circular credit, right, where credit expansion can go on indefinitely, infinite money created. This is just flatly wrong, as as you, I just described. All money eventually becomes hoarded due to the fact that not 100% of everybody's money is always lent, right? So eventually yeah. it's all hoarded. If there's a, say, 9% reserve rate for every single person, you end up with, I forget, it, it comes out to about 9 uh, or about, about uh, 8.76 times more money and money, uh, more money instruments than you started with. That's it. Right? But that number that if you have a 9% reserve, if that doesn't change, that expansion exists and doesn't change. It's not inflationary in, our, as in the terms of our previous discussion. It's a constant, right? The level of expansion grow unless people's time preferences change. Yeah. And, so and, uh, it's not, there's no, there's not even any inflation as a result of it. Yeah, Fritz, uh, Fritz Machlip was very good on this. He was a student of Mises, um, and he, he made the observation, which is very true, that you know, just like you can speculate on credit uh, you know, or the extension of fiduciary media by banks, you can absolutely speculate on hoarding as well. And there's nothing stopping that in the free market. And then it goes down the line, as Eric said. I, I, I'm not arguing that there's no limit. It's just theoretically what I, the point i was trying to make earlier which i think is important we should understand about banking and lending how bitcoin slices through that is that the credit comes from within within us i mean it comes like there, there's no end that promises that we can make so yeah we could take the same bitcoin lend it around to ourselves and then our families hundreds of times whether we should do that <laughs> is is another question whether someone should a, make that investment but isn't that a, but isn't that right rehypothecation i mean isn't it's absolutely rehypothecation, okay. but the, but the, 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 there's no, there's nothing inherently wrong with that in the market as long as it satisfies the supply and demand of the economy, because you, you can use that with any business, right? Like Uber, you know, do they 100% reserve all their cars for the night? I use that example a lot. Or any other business. I mean, insurance as well. If the world ended and insurance had to pay out all of the claims that it promised, it wouldn't be able to pay them out, the insurance industry. It's just, it's simple. There's no, there's no way, but what do they use? They use actuarial tables, they use history, they use statistics, they use business, they use entrepreneurship, they use supply and demand well, to understand. But everybody does this. Right? I, I, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. This is business, right? It's, it's, this is, this is a, it, right, I'm agreeing, I, I'm agreeing with, right? Everybody has to decide how much money to hold in reserve versus invest. And that amount of reserve is probabilistic. They're gaps and businesses all fail. Any business fails, fails because they don't have enough cash, cash flow. Right? 
failure to estimate their reserve requirements um, or to man, you know, to maintain their reserve. So banks can fail to maintain their necessary reserve requirements to satisfy withdrawals and businesses can fail to maintain the reserve requirements for operations and individuals can do the same thing. Everybody has a reserve requirement. Everybody who has capital lends some and hoards the rest. You know, that can be zero and a hundred or a hundred and zero, but the important observation that I'm trying to get people to recognize as the, is that without lending, there's nothing, right? <laughs> there's no production. Well, and but, but, but Eric, on, nothing on, to lend. I'm, I'm not so sure about that point because it can, like Alice build up production stages on her own, right? She does not necessarily need the capital by Bob well, in order to build her fishing. I'll refer, you, I'll refer you to first principles that are very clearly elucidated uh, in man economy in the state. It goes through a very clear explanation of this. Alice can't do anything unless Alice has savings because Alice needs to eat. And while she's doing this building, she's not gathering food. Uh, Eric, you can, you, it, can you repeat the last ten? Whatever she's producing. Eric, can you repeat the there last ten seconds? Sorry, I'm driving through a parking garage and maybe yeah, you cut have, out. Yeah. Um, all all production takes time, right? All action occurs through time, and that time, while a person is producing, requires that they survive, right? At a minimum which means they need to eat, they need all the necessities that if, if they hadn't had savings, there would be none of, right? They have to save first. Accumulate a hoard, right? And then take some fraction of to, to all production, some of your own savings to your own production, or you lend it to somebody else. So without lending, there is no production, therefore no products. And the important observation is that lending is what creates fractionalism, it's what creates risk, and it's what creates credit expansion. They can't be separated from lending, and lending can't be separated from production. So but these I are agree inherent on the, on the second point, in, but human, inherent. in humanity, right? But, but you said that Alice can build out of her own savings, right? And her own savings do not, are, are not lent by Bob. So if you, if you take some of your own savings, so I started invested in this so that I have time to make a product that I can sell. Until I can sell it, I have no money, I need to live off of my investment. My company needs to live off of my investment. It doesn't make an economic difference whether you lend that to yourself in the, for the purpose of production or, or whether you lend it to somebody else. Yeah, okay, okay, I get it. Yeah, that, that makes sense now. Yeah. All right. And I would, so, just, I would make it more simple as well. I mean, there's no limit to the promises that we can make. And, um, Credit is within us. I mean, credit, credit, you don't, you don't even need, uh, Sidney Homer wrote this uh, in the history of interest rates, which is a great, it's a great, I mean, tome if people haven't read. You're not going to find like hot tips or something about the markets, but it, there's a lot of good stuff in there. And he made this observation, which is totally true, is that credit needs no money, it needs no commodity, it needs no barter. I mean, you can, you can make a promise with anyone, absolutely yeah. no problem. And it's that, just an empty, is... it's an empty promise though. So those empty promises tend to fail. So in it, the market, right, eliminates those. And what you end up with is promises that probabilistically get fulfilled. Um, the others become default, right? And so people work very hard to eliminate default, right? But it's always a possibility. Therefore, there's always risk. Um, but those, those ability to make promises that aren't kept are limited by the market. You can make them, right? And you can default and you can make them again, but nobody's going to trade with somebody who continues to default, right? People are making these promises in exchange for something. I don't right? disagree with that. So, I don't know. So, so they're not going to get the something if they're not worthy of the promise and people protect that and call it reputation, right? So that they can trade. So but it is limited by market force law. But, but again, the forces will, will regulate that. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, th I enjoyed this talk so much, guys. I mean, it's it was overdue, very educational. But one final thing I wanted to ask you. So uh, we talk about you know hoarding and saving, you know the exact opposite of what Kane, Keynes uh, you know uh, pr preached about whatever he preached about animal spirits. We all die one day, and we gotta you know spend first, right? So. Uh, there's you know a bunch of uh, hodl maximalists to which I would count myself to, into that. Um, what I'm trying to con you know convey this vision like what would it be like if a critical mass of people, whatever one two three billion people, started from now on accumulating buying some satoshis, hodling it for I don't know a number of years. W can we like you know communicate this like what 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 would reality look like for the social you know uh, monetary economical? Well, I I can tell you what economics predicts will happen or, or what says must happen. Mm -hmm. If 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 there's a if there's an increase in the level of hoarding, capital becomes more scarce. Interest rates rise, right? Mm -hmm. Interest rates rise because people need to produce things and they want to sell them, and prices are rising because there's no things. Right, because capital has been restricted. So people will either find alternatives, right, because the price of money in this money is rising, therefore they're going to use some other money. Or people who are hoarding realize, wow, now the return on investing as opposed to hoarding has gone up. So now my time preference is satisfied, right? I, my, my time preference might have said to me, I will only invest my Bitcoin if I can get 20% on it because I feel like I can somehow earn 20% by speculating on it as a hoard. But now interest rates have risen to 25% because there's no, nobody can get any money. So now I'll invest, right? So it, it's simply a supply and demand relation. And we are already there, right? People already make these decisions. It's not like something that's going to happen in the future. It happens all the time. Yeah, uh, good points. And maybe a, a bit further than uh, I would say we will see an increase in production stages, uh, which uh, which is the act of, of investing, right? And then we, we see, or with, with this, we can build more elaborate tools and these tools can, can be used in order to help us to remove the uneasiness. Uh, so meaning that because we have better means at our disposal, we can achieve more, well, complex or, or more higher order ends. So we can focus on the tasks that are really, really difficult, and we can focus on solving these unbelievably difficult problems. Um, and yeah. What, what is it that's giving us this increase, the increase in productivity? Well, the lowest time preference, right? Because our time preference is so super low, we are much more future oriented. What, like in, right? No? What's causing our time preference to be super low? Um, <laughs> Remember, time preference is a given. It can't be deduced. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We don't know, right? Yeah. Time preference doesn't really change because there's a different kind of money, right? That's, that's a big error. Mm -hmm. And anybody who, who says that they can predict what causes time preference generally to rise or fall is making a praxeological error because that's a fundamental, that's an axiom, right? Time preference is a given. Um, it can't be deduced. It's assumed. Um, I mean, it's, it's in people's minds. It can't be derived. So the axiom is assumed, it's presumed in, in, in Austrian economics. So what we could say though, is that if this use of this money is allowing us to avoid say taxation um, through inflation or direct through uh, transaction transparency, in other words, enforcing of other taxes, then people have more capital to put to productive use. Mm -hmm. Doesn't imply a time preference change. It implies there's, there's more capital to be put into production. So it's capital that grows capital, right? And, and it's capital that's available for production. Capital that's consumed by the state is burned capital, right? People basically, um, the, the act of aggression is, is, is the act of forcing people to do things they don't want to do because they would have done in the market without the state. So really the objective of production and products is for people to get what they want and taking that away from them with aggression is anti-productive, right? So any capital that we can take out of the state and put towards productive use will make us wealthier as society. And so if we're, if we're going to argue that 
Bitcoin will make people wealthier and therefore increase production, it's by saving them tax, right? Mm -hmm. um, the tax on, you know, the cost of transferring money around the world, the time that they have to wait, the, the inflation that they would have to pay in estate money, um, the enforcement of other taxes through full transaction transparency to the state. These costs are what Bitcoin reduces. It's its value proposition. And, uh, and reducing those costs through technology, right? That's the purpose of technology is to, is to um, um, give people more of what they want. Bitcoin can do that. But by saying it's a hard money and it reduce, it, you know, and increase, it reduces time preferences is just an error. <laughs> Matthew? I'm not sure what the question was. <laughs> uh, now, the reason I'm asking is because uh, Mr. Safid Namus in his book, uh, pages 96 to 98, he compares the 19th century and the 20th century. 19th century, the gold standard, hard money, and the 20th century, easy, you know, central banking, Keynesianism. And he says, in the 19th century, when we had a gold standard, you know, hard money, there were much more original uh, uh, transformation or whatever, original technological innovations versus the 20th century. So this is sort of my personal hope that we are going into a new era with the hardest, or whatever I call it, the hardest, scarcest money ever created in human history with Bitcoin, that we, you know, because of our, our low time, lowest time preference, that's my assumption, let's just call it my assumption, that we would go into a really new era, scientifically, technologically, you know, more original innovations. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, sound money is uh, is important, and it has. I, I, I tend to look at just the sound money as important. It's been co-opted by the state. Bitcoin is there to uh, get around that co-option and offer uh, a better tool for saving and investing uh, and in society in the future. So <laughs> all of our hopes that it will do it. And um, right. yeah. Eric, we can't hear you. Uh, I think it's. I think it's. You know, it can't be proven. Therefore, it is. You can't hear me, huh? Hold on yeah. a second. Yeah, Am I uh, still here? So, sorry, I think uh, my uh, my my closing of my my phone caused me to disappear. I'm uh, I'm gonna have to split in a in a few because I. Uh, Got to go check on my flight. Hold on just a second. Uh, yeah, I'm good for a bit. So, so all of us going to. I was going to say is that the uh, the comments on the book, um, those are not economic statements. Those are not provable statements. Those are subjective. Are okay, but <laughs> if anything is subjective, it's the quality of art um, or the value somebody might place in it. So I, I dismiss all of those types of comments uh, just out of hand from, from the perspective of economics. Um, so, you know, was there sounder money? Sound is not even well-defined, right? We, we, when we have more capital to put to productive use, we are wealthier because we're getting the things we want whether somebody judges the art as good or bad is irrelevant, right? It's what people, whatever people want, even if it's crappy art from my perspective. So the, the objective, and it's not a change, nothing can predict a change to time preference generally, right? It's a given. So we can't say that even having better tools changes time preference. Um, people have a preference for things now versus later based on their own individual desires, just like they value a piece of art more than another based on their own individual preferences. That's why we call it a preference. Um, it's not objective. It can't be derived. So I, when we're talking about economic theory, those are all irrelevant. But what we can say is that if people can put more of their own capital pr to productive use, people have more of what they want. In a, you know, in a freer market, essentially. And that is what wealth is, people getting more of what they want. Um, and the Bitcoin, I think, as Matt just said, um, makes is a tool that essentially saves people money and therefore great. But it will not eliminate, as I think you know, my, my, my final point on, on fractionalism, 
it will not eliminate fractional banking. It cannot eliminate fractional banking, even if you, even if you eliminate the word banking. It cannot eliminate or change fractionalism or um, um, credit expansion or risk. The things that everybody wants to put on banks are inherent in economy, necessary. And this is why it's important to separate the state from banking when talking about banking, because the state does make banking look bad, right? But lending is not bad, it's necessary. If, if we were to go to 100% reserve, there's no lending, none whatsoever, right? There's no products. So it's a, it's a ridiculous, from an economic standpoint, objective, right? First, unachievable in a free market, um, totally unachievable, but second, not desirable in any way. It couldn't be anything worse than no production. Well, thank you so much. Wonderful concluding, uh, you know, thoughts and um, guys, thank you so much. Um, I hope we can repeat this. It was very fruitful. I learned a lot and I'm sure our listeners and viewers too. And yeah, Eric, have a good trip. Thank you so much for putting us together. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fun. I learned a lot. I think it was over to you. These are like the things that I think need to be articulated or broken down for, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, spheres of people because everybody's like on a different, uh, you know, level of understanding. You got to pick them up where they are, I always say. So Max, Matt, thank, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, thoughts, opinions. <laughs> well, yeah, thank Thanks you very much for, having for, the, for the kind invite, Kevan. I, I just checked through through the episodes you did previously and pretty much all of the people you interviewed are, are good friends of mine, so I just <laughs> yeah. uh, So that's nice. Uh, Eric, thank you uh, also for joining us. Uh, good uh, to have you on to always pull us back to first principles. That's nice. Uh, and and Matthew, you probably as, as the utmost authority in, in money supply. Uh, that uh, That's definitely good to have you on the conversations as well. So thank yeah. you very much and see you on the next one. Yeah, I'll add your... Thanks, uh, Thanks thank you. Kevin. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye. Take care. Hope to see you soon. Bye.